Hi there, this is Al24 News live from Algiers, coming up next in our news program. Iran and the world powers resumed nuclear talks for the first time in five months as diplomats tried to solve the 2015 deal of nuclear talks plus. Britain's foreign spy chief Richard Moore, in his first statement since taking office in 2020, warned that the West's rivals, including China and Russia, are racing to master artificial intelligence in a way that might make a revolution in geopolitics over the next decade. And finally, foreign ministers of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization will meet today in the Latvian capital Riga to discuss issues on the organization's agenda. Iran and the world powers resumed on Monday nuclear talks that have been waiting for more than five months. Vienna talks retackled the uranium enrichment that Iran is working on. In voice and talk, participants are willing to find a radical solution for the uproar that this issue made in energy world, especially after the withdrawal of the U.S. from the talks three years ago. Ayadi Usama. The long-awaited talks between Iran and the world powers resumed on Monday in order to restore the 2015 deal which created an uproar in the world regarding its importance and sensibility. During the last five months, this issue created complications, especially after the United States left negotiations with the Iranian government. After the first round of talks, a UN boy announced his positive vision about resuming the talks concerning Iranian attempts of enriching uranium and the last accusations of the International Atomic Energy Agency. While Iranian Vienna negotiators explained that making a new deal is impossible as long as the sanctions are not dropped. However, the envoy of the European Union in Rekimura stated that this condition is likely to be refused by Washington. Two process, parallel process. One is the works of the Joint Commission, the working groups that involves all participant states into the GCPOA. At the same time, we have uh, the American delegation, we have uh, proximity talks between uh, the Iranian and the American delegation. They on the other hand, the West showed fear on the Iranian advancement in nuclear bomb capability. On its behalf, the U.S. offered its ability to put more pressure on Iran if talks fail. Iranian side insisted that the Iranian atomic program is peaceful and no further talks will make it through as long as the EU and the U.S. didn't promise to lift all the sanctions from the Iranian side as the latter is not seeking nuclear weaponry. And to talk more about the latest insights regarding this topic, I'm joined live by Hamoud Salhi, Professor and Associate Dean of International Education from California, the United States of America. First, Hamoud, what to expect from Iran's nuclear talks as they resumed in Vienna? So the, the positive side, Nadia, is that uh, the, the parties are returning to negotiation. That's one. The other thing is that we are really at a stage, what we call pre-negotiation stage, so where they are checking each other's uh, temperature. The bottom line uh, we've seen uh, with the United States, for example, uh, saying that the time is short for Iran uh, and that they will have they will use alternative uh, sources uh, to pressure Iran. On the other hand, uh, the Iranians have announced uh, that their stock pile of uranium has increased uh, from 60 pounds to 66 and that their enriched uranium uh, from 20 uh, uh, to 20 percent or from 20 percent has also increased. These two uh, uh, parties are now setting up themselves for how to negotiate later. And the declaration by both the United States and Iran are in this perspective. So we don't expect much result other than uh, public relations, uh, media, where each party will try to convince the, uh, that they 
did their best to bring the other party to negotiation. The bottom line is that the two parties have different positions. The, new, uh, the, the Iranians want to go back to the, uh, to the negotiations, uh, uh, the 2000, uh, 2015 nego- uh, agreement. The, Iran- the Americans want to include ballistic missiles and, uh, and the, the Iranians' uh, strategic uh, role in, in the Gulf region. Those two, negoci- those two positions are still very, very different. And that's where the progress yes, will be seen. Uh, Unfortunately, it will not be happening. Dr. On this Hamoud, uh, there are some talks that Iran is quite sticking to its terms. How do you think is this going to affect the, these nuclear talks? Well, they have been successful in the past. In the, in the 2015, the Iranians were clear that they wanted the negotiation to lead somewhere. And in fact, it led to 2015 by, pro, by getting assurances uh, from the Americans and, and the other parties of the agreement that their national security were, were respected, that the ballistic missiles were, were not included uh, because they're part of their cell, de, uh, cell defense. So they, have, they are sticking to their point because they have leverage. Number one, uh, they have strategic partnership with China that will avoid any challenges they, they might get from uh, uh, the United States sanctions and the European sanctions as well. So that will bring them some kind of economic de- dependence. The s- independence. The second thing is that they have strategic depth. They have strong relationship with the with the uh, with the region uh, 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 with the regional countries, particularly in Yemen. Uh, they have a strong hand in, in in the resolution of Syria, and more than anything. Else, they have partners in the in the Arab in the Arab world that are not happy with how the Israelis are handling the Palestinian issue. And third, they have a strong leverage in Afghanistan. It was because of the Iranian role that the uh, uh, that the United States was able to establish the system that eventually failed in Afghanistan. Their role is now expanded because they have open uh, uh, ties with or uh, strengthened their ties with Pakistan. They are uh, they are uh, and, and China. And the, th- the fourth country, and uh, also resolved the conflict that they, they have with the Afghan leadership uh, in terms of the religious doctrines, differences, talking, and things like that. Uh, so they are Dr. preparing Hamoud, to play a major role in, that re- in Afghanistan here, as well. Talking about Iran and its relations with different countries around the world, do you think that the Zionist entity is able to push on Iran not to become a nuclear power? Oh, they are the, the main reason we are at this stage, and the United States is not able uh, to go back to the 2015 agreement because of that reason. The, the Israelis have been uh, very clear in refusing to allow any uh, development of nuclear power, for that matter, not just Iran, but any other country in, in the Arab world. Let's not forget Iran, Iraq uh, program in 1980. What the Israelis are doing are launching three major attacks or ma- attacks on the front. One is on the cyber. Uh, security threats, which they are constantly uh, attacking the Iranian infrastructures. They are also uh, uh, attempting to issue military attacks on the Iranians. Some of them are, are, uh, are real. Some of them are just for public consumption. And the third one, which is really uh, very, uh, uh, we need to take it a serious look at it, it's how the Israelis are expanding the normalizations that they have signed with some Arab countries to include military pacts. Uh, this is include what the, the Israelis are planning planning to do in, in, in certain countries in the Arab world by expanding the relationship to a, mili- a military pact that will give strength to these countries and, and put them against the uh, Ira- seeing Iran as, uh, as a threat. So they are launching on different th- front and they are eager uh, to make, uh, uh, and they are very, very uh, eager not to allow uh, Iran to be nuclear. Thank you so much, Hamoud Salhi, yeah. Professor and You're Associate welcome, Dean of International Education, you joined us live from California, the United States of America. And moving on now to another story, the United Nations expressed concern about isolating African nations over Omicron variant, while African President Cyril Ramaphosa called for easing the restrictions. Let's follow this report. On Monday, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres raised alarm about the potential consequences of travel restrictions imposed on countries in southern Africa by several governments in order to prevent the spread of the new corona variant Omicron. Guterres said in a statement, I am now deeply concerned about the isolation of southern African countries due to the new COVID-19 travel restrictions. 
while appreciating South Africa for rapidly detecting and reporting the new variant's development. The UN chief stated the people of Africa cannot be blamed for the low level of vaccinations and they should not be penalized for identifying and sharing crucial science and health information with the world. The latter encouraged higher levels of testing for travelers along with other appropriate and truly effective measures instead. Jacob Zuma, South Africa's ex-president, has called for the easing of the Omicron travel bans. The current president of South Africa criticized travel bans imposed on his country and its neighbors as a result of the new Omicron variant. Cyril Ramaphosa expressed his disappointment with the decision, which he described as arbitrary, and demanded that the prohibitions be lifted immediately. We need to resist unjustified as well as unscientific travel restrictions that only serve to further disadvantage developing economies. We have seen how some countries have started restricting travel to other countries, thus damaging their economies and particularly sectors of their economies that rely on the travel of people around the world. The United Kingdom, the European Union, the United States and Japan are among the countries that have enforced travel bans. U.S. President Joe Biden has called the Omicron COVID-19 variant a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. His statement comes a day after the new COVID-19 Omicron was detected in North America. Nabil Khazini. In a speech at the White House, U.S. President Joe Biden called the new COVID-19 Omicron variant a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. This variant is a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. Biden added that the U.S. would face the new threat just as it has faced those that have come before it, urging everyone to get vaccinated and get their booster shots, saying it is the best protection against this new variant as well as any other variants. It gives us time to take more actions, to move quicker, to make sure people understand you have to get your vaccine, you have to get the shot, you have to get the get the booster if you're the sooner or later we're going to see cases of this new variant here in the United States. We'll have to face this new threat just as we face those that come before it. Asked about the decision to ban travels into the U.S. from South Africa and seven other African nations on Monday, Biden answered saying it was a step forward that gives the U.S. more time to respond to the new variant. I, 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 I don't think so. I don't think that's what's going to happen. And uh, I want to, again, the reason for the immediate travel ban is there were a significant number of cases, unlike any other country, well, the few around South Africa in the world. We needed time to give people an opportunity to say, get that vaccination now before it heads. It's going to move around the world. Omicron raised concern between world leaders and people fear new lockdown measures will be imposed. However, restrictions are back amid the detection of Omicron in several cities around the world. We will require anyone who enters the UK to take a PCR test by the end of the second day after their arrival and to self-isolate until they have a negative result. The Omicron variant was the quickest to be labeled a variant of concern by the World Health Organization because of its seemingly fast spread in South Africa and its many troubling mutations. The Chinese president stated on Monday that China will provide another 1 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccinations to African countries to prevent the spread of the new variant. This action would encourage Chinese enterprises to invest in Africa over the next three years. Islam Seed. China has offered a billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine to African countries. This comes as part of a forum between China and African states with an emphasis on trade and security, which could be a move to encourage Chinese companies to invest at least $10 billion in Africa over the next three years. The pledge of additional vaccine doses comes as concerns grow about the spread of a new variant discovered in South Africa. The Chinese leader stated that his country would donate 600 million doses directly. The other 400 million doses would be provided from investments in production sites. 
Vaccination rates in Africa are low when compared to the rest of the world, with many states relying on foreign donations due to the lack of local manufacturing facilities and prohibitive costs of mass purchases. According to the Chinese embassy in Dakar, Beijing invests heavily in Africa and is the continent's largest trading partner, with direct trade worth more than $200 billion dollars in 2019. Last month, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden announced vaccine donations to Africa, promising the African Union with 17 million doses of the single-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Due to the scale of its land-in to developing countries in Africa and elsewhere, Beijing has frequently been accused of debt trap diplomacy, using its creditor status to extract diplomatic and commercial concessions. During a recent trip to Africa, Blinken made a reference to the accusations without explicitly naming China, saying in a speech in Nigeria that Africans have been wary of the strings that often accompany foreign engagements, which China on its behalf denies the allegations. The Algerian Minister of Health took part in a special session of the World Health Organization. Mr. Ben Bouzi delivered a speech on the health challenges confronting the African continent and the expected role of World Health Organization in facing the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister of Health called on the international community to implement the process in question according to an integrated and progressive approach, taking into account the lessons learned from the corona pandemic. Britain's foreign spy chief Richard Moore, in his first statement since taking office in 2020, warned today, Tuesday, that the West rivals, including China and Russia, are racing to master artificial intelligence in a way that might take a revolution in geopolitics over the next decade. Hussein Berkan. Richard Moore, who rarely gives public speeches, said Tuesday that China and Russia are pumping money and ambition into perfecting artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and synthetic biology, because they know that mastering these technologies will give them leverage. He added that the massive data sets and advances in computer power poses threats that needs to be addressed by the West. Moore, the former diplomat who became the head of MI6 in 2020, stated also that technological progress over the next decade could outpace all technological advances over the past century, and that the money and the efforts invested by Beijing and Moscow in technological advances will reshape espionage and geopolitics. The world's spies are trying to counter unprecedented developments in technology that challenge traditional human-led espionage operations, which have dominated for thousands of years. I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads, by a lot. It's noteworthy that the economic and military rise of China over the past 40 years is considered one of the most significant geopolitical events of the recent times. Along with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, which ended the Cold War. The Western intelligence agencies fear that within a few decades Beijing will dominate all major emerging technologies, especially artificial intelligence, synthetic, biology and genetics. Barbados is from Namona Republic. This historic event comes almost 400 years after the first English ship arrived on its golden shore. The former British colony inaugurated Sandra Mason as its first president, Nabil Khazini. It all started here when the first English ship touched the island on May 400 years ago. Under the command of Captain John Powell, the island was therefore claimed on behalf of King James I. Barbados remained a British colony until internal autonomy was granted in 1961. The island, which was named Los Barbados, meaning bearded ones, by the Portuguese explorer Pedro A. Campos, is now the world's newest republic. In a historic event, marking the 25th anniversary of its independence, the island has cut the last of its colonial ties and inaugurated Sandra Mason as its first black head of state. I, Sandra Prunella Mason, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Barbados according to law, so help me God. I, Sandra Prunella Mason, do swear that I will well and truly serve Barbados in the office of president, so help me God. Sandra Mason replaced Queen Elizabeth, who ruled over the island for more than half a century, 
Prince Charles, invited to attend the ceremony and to witness the removal of his mother as head of the island, expressed the pain of the shared history between Britain and Barbados. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history, the people of this island forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. Barbados announced its plan to become a republic last year, but it will remain within the Commonwealth, a grouping of 54 countries across Africa, Asia, the Americas and Europe. Experts have said Barbados' move may fuel republicanism in other Commonwealth realms, especially in Jamaica, where the two main political parties support breaking away from the monarchy. Thousands of migrants continue to wait in Belarus to enter the European Union through Poland, a crisis in the Central European country that has sharply divided its society between those who want to assist migrants and those who refuse to open their borders. Zara Forgeni reports. The UN's migration organization said Monday that up to 2,000 migrants and refugees have massed at the Belarusian-Polish border and an estimated 7,000 are currently in Belarus. Responding to the Belarusian EU border situation, the International Organization for Migration said it had increased their assistance for migrants and refugees, providing humanitarian aid at the border and intensifying voluntary return opportunities. The IOM, UN Refugee Agency and Belarus Red Cross have been granted access to the migrants and refugees at the border by the Belarusian authorities on several occasions in recent weeks, assessing the migrants' conditions and needs. International observers accused Polish leaders of choosing to ignore the humanitarian factor and focus only on the geopolitical conflict with Belarus and Russia. Poland and the Polish authorities are not viewing this only as a humanitarian crisis. The response has been very militarized and the language that is being used, it's a language of attack, war, hybrid war, conflict. They are also taking um, into account what is happening on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Um, where Russia has deployed 100,000 uh, soldiers and additional equipment. Since August, the EU countries bordering Belarus have reported a dramatically growing number of migrants. More than 8,000 people have tried to enter the bloc via the Belarus-EU border in 2021, up sharply from just 150 last year. According to a senior defense official, the Pentagon will focus on building up bases in Guam and Australia to better prepare the U.S. military to counter China. The moves have been prom promoted by the Department of Defense's Global Poster Review, which President Joe Biden ordered Secretary of Defense Leo Austin to undertake shortly after taking office in February. The foreign ministers of North Atlantic Treaty Organization met today in the Latvian capital Riga to discuss issues on the organization's agenda, on top of which are Russian military activities in the Crimea. The meeting, led by the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, will be attended by the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Koliba and Georgian David Zelkaliani on an exceptional basis to discuss Russian activities. Hussein Berkan. NATO's foreign ministers will discuss the alliance relations with Russia and the issues of Belarus, Afghanistan and Ukraine during their meeting in the Latvia capital of Riga. The meeting is expected to focus on tensions over Ukraine and NATO's strategy in the wake of its withdrawal from Afghanistan. The ministers will also discuss the migrant crisis in Belarus, which Western countries accuse the Belarusian authorities of having caused. In a joint press conference with Latvia President Eagles Levitz in Riga on Monday, NATO Secretary General Ian Stoltenberg called on Moscow to reduce tension and de-escalate amid reports confirming that Russia was bolstering its military presence at the Ukrainian border. This is the second time this year that Russia has, a, has amassed large and unusual concentration of forces in this region. We see heavy weapons, artillery, armored units, drones, and electronic warfare uh, systems, and tens of thousands of combat-ready troops. This military buildup is unprovoked and unexplained. It raises tensions and risks uh, miscalculation. 
any future Russian aggression against Ukraine would come at a high price and have serious political and economic consequences for Russia. Last Friday, NATO Secretary General Ian Stoltenberg accused Russia of massing military forces near the border with Ukraine in an unusual manner, warning that Russia would pay a heavy price in the event of its incursion into Ukraine. Stoltenberg also accused Belarus saying it was exploiting immigrants to put pressure on NATO countries, especially Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. It is noteworthy that Russia has repeatedly stressed that the movement of Russian forces within the territory of Russia do not pose a threat to anyone. Senegalese Foreign Minister Aisata Talsal held talks with State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Dakar hoping that China would lend support in the fight against insecurity in the conflict-ridden Sahel region at the start of a China-Africa summit. Marwa Bilaywar. Senegalese Foreign Minister told reporters in Dakar after meeting with her Chinese counterpart Wang Yi that she hoped China would be a strong voice in the vast semi-arid regions fighting terrorism. Terrorists are active across much of the Sahara region, south of the Sahara Desert, fighting a long-running struggle despite the presence of French troops and United Union forces. Aisa Tassal made her remarks at the beginning of a China-Africa summit in Senegal, which is scheduled to focus on economic and security issues, and that will be over today. The program executive, the cooperation cultural. Executive Cultural Cooperation Program that the two parties have just stabilized will be signed at the two next session of the Great Joint Commission for the Cooperation between Senegal and China, and will further boost our exchanges in all cultural subsectors, in other words, the Dakar Forum will be a great moment of meeting and exchange. It will be a privileged moment to strengthen cooperation between China and Africa through the economic, social and cultural potentials of African countries. The summit comes after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Kenya, Nigeria and Senegal earlier this month amid escalating rivalry between Beijing and Washington. According to the Chinese embassy in Dakar, China invests significantly in Africa and is the continent's largest trading partner, with direct trade worth more than $200 billion in 2019. Left-wing opposition candidate Xiomara Castro won Honduras' presidential election, becoming the country's first female president and ending 12 years of conservative rule by the National Party, which has been full of scandals linked to organized crime and cocaine smuggling. Xiomara Castro is the wife of former President Ziala, who was overthrown by a coup in 2009 and the leader of the left-wing Liberian Party. And for more world news, let's follow these news briefs. Swedish lawmakers have re-elected Magdalena Andersson as prime minister just days after she resigned. On Tuesday, she must present the king with her governmental appointments. She's now becoming the country's first female leader. The Ugandan military has announced joint air and weaponry raids against the Allied Democratic Forces Armed Group with forces from the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Ugandan authorities have blamed the Allied Democratic Forces, which is affiliated with ASIL for earlier this month's deadly suicide bombing in the capital, Kampala, in addition to dozens of attacks in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. At least 22 civilians were killed in an attack on an internally displaced person camp in Congo's northeast. The same camp was attacked less than a week ago, killing 29 people. The armed group Cooperative for the Development of Congo has been accused of carrying out the attack on Ivo camp on Sunday. Rohingya refugees have been resettled on an inhabited island in the Bay of Bengal. About 1,500 people will be transferred from Cox Bazar camp to Basanchar Island. And more than 1 million Rohingya Muslims are currently living in the overcrowded camp. 
The civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who was ousted and arrested following a military coup on February 1st, faces several charges that could see her detained for the rest of her life if convicted. Myanmar court deferred an initial judgment in the trial of deposed leader to December 6 on Tuesday. Qatar will send its foreign minister to Beirut to discuss ways of providing support as Lebanon's economic crisis has pushed more than three-quarters of the population into poverty. Protesters blocked roads across Lebanon in protest of the country's economic collapse. Jack Dorsey, the company's co-founder, is leaving his post as Twitter's chief executive for the second time in his career after he was the first CEO of a social platform in 27 until he stepped down from the job the following year, then returned to that role in 2015. The CEO gave no specific reason for his departure other than an abstract argument that Twitter should break away from its founders and this time he says it's by choice. The National Labor Relations Board has ordered a new union election for Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama. Based on objections to the first vote that took place in April, the move announced that it is a blow to Amazon, which has spent a year aggressively campaigning for warehouse workers in Bessemer to reject the union, which they ultimately did by a wide margin. The Friday session's decline saw Bitcoin drop 20% below a record high and even earlier in November, which for many strategists showcases the coin's tendency to closely track moves of the broader stock market. Black Friday came to cryptocurrencies last week when Bitcoin posted its roughest day in two months. Yet, by Monday, things were looking up. That's all for me, Nadia Kasmi, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.